Hello and welcome. Thank you for participating in Moorhead at Home Skywatching, hosted by Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. My name is Amy Sale. I'm an educator at Moorhead. We are a unit of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, located on campus. We also work throughout the state through a number of outreach initiatives, like our summer camp programs, mobile lab vans, and the annual North Carolina Science Festival. Our mission is to help people better understand science, technology, and health, and we do this through engaging learning opportunities like this live virtual event. We're happy to have you here today for August Carolina Skies, and uh, Nick will explain our plan. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today from Moorhead at Home Skywatching. My name is Nick Eeks. I'm an educator at Moorhead Planetarium and Science Center. Um, and as Amy said, today we're talking all about the August Carolina skies. So our goal is to be able to give you some tips and tricks and tools so that when you go stargazing over the next month or so, you know what you're looking at and you know how to find things. Um, this is one of our very favorite topics to cover because it combines some basic sky watching tips with uh, some information about what all those objects are up in the sky. So the way we're gonna show it to you today is by using our flat screen planetarium. It's called Stellarium. <clears throat> and we'll put a link in the chat uh, for the website so that you can check this out yourself. It's a really cool free open source program. Um, you know, nothing beats being under the big planetarium dome, but right now we're not open. So this is a pretty good uh, secondary, um, a secondary way to do it. Um, and I'm gonna share my screen in a moment, but I wanna tell you beforehand that if you have questions throughout this session, we wanna hear them. And the way to send those to us is to use the Q and A function that's down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it might be at the top if you're using your phone. And that way, if you know, you're know you not sure about something or there's like a burning question that you've really, really wanted to ask, you can put it in there and we are, are gonna take some time kind of towards the end uh, to answer as many questions as we can. So I encourage you to do that. Um, but let's get to it. We have a lot of sky to cover. Um, part of what we do in these sessions is stay up pretty late. So um, let's get our late night started. Um, and I'm gonna give you a look at your Stellarium screen. So <clears throat> if you've been with us before for these sessions, this probably looks familiar to you. Um, but if this is your first time, I want to explain a little bit about what we are seeing here, um, because it looks a little different than what you would see just walking outside. Um, obviously, you see a really nice bright blue sky and you see some green grass here. Um, that shows us in one way or another where the horizon is. The place where the sky meets the ground. So I'm trying to drag my cursor along it here. Um, the horizon in this view separates the sky from the ground. Your horizon is going to be different depending on where you are. So if you're in the mountains or down at the coast, you might have some other stuff in the way. Um, we, we picked a, um, <clears throat> a location that kind of looks like a field right here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And speaking of location, yes, we have our latitude and longitude set uh, to Chapel Hill. If you're in the southeastern United States, the views you're going to get are going to be very similar. If you are elsewhere, um, you might have to adjust a little bit. But if you're on a similar latitude, um, you know, we're giving you a pretty accurate look uh, of what you can see. So along with seeing the horizon, you also see some big red letters on the horizon. Um, you probably know what those stand for. Right now, we're facing south. West is over here on our right. East is actually over here on our left, but it's kind of hiding uh, behind the corner there. So <clears throat> right now this is a, a southward view. And the important part about that is that I know north is missing, but you can imagine it's kind of over behind us in this view because the top of the sky or the zenith is somewhere about right here. So I know that's a lot of information, but I just want to try to orient you to this. The last important piece of the puzzle is to orient you to the clock because we're gonna be doing a lot of time traveling today. Um, the clock is right down here below that big letter S. You see the date, it's 2020, the year 2020, uh, 08, that's August, and today's the 18th. And right now it's a little bit after 10 a.m. So, <clears throat> excuse me, keep an eye on that clock uh, throughout the session because it's going to change as we move forward in time. So along with all of those things I just pointed out, you probably notice a couple of things in the sky. Um, I hope so, at least. I see the very bright sun, but I also see this weird dark circle right here. Amy, what do you think that weird dark circle is? Yeah, I don't know about you, Nick. I have never seen something like that in the real sky. So that is Stellarium um, attempting to represent the moon. 
And uh, you wouldn't actually see this moon if you walked outside right now, because um, what Stellarium is trying to show you is that the side of the moon facing us right now is dark. You're not gonna be able to pick it out um, from the background of the sky. So you wouldn't actually see it. Uh, you notice that the moon is in the uh, same line of sight more or less as the sun. Um, it's up in the daytime right now, and it's the back side of the moon, the far side of the moon that's being lit up by the sun. So the side facing us is dark. So we have a question for you all. Um, and don't sweat it. If you don't know the answer, just take your best guess. What's the moon phase today, August 18th, 2020? We're showing you um, what it looks like. And your choices are new moon, first quarter, full moon, or last quarter. So go ahead and uh, take your best, give us your best idea on that. Um, the phase of the moon changes um, over roughly a month. It takes about a month, about a moon for the moon to orbit Earth. And as it does so, um, different amounts of the side facing us uh, get illuminated by the sun. So right now it's the phase where we can't actually see it because the side facing us is dark. So let's see what you all said. Oh, looks like three quarters of you all um, got it. It is new moon. And some people thought, well, I'm not really sure. Maybe it's one of those other phases. So it's actually new moon right now. So not a good time to see it. Um, but we'll show you a little bit. Uh, we'll do a little time travel in a moment and give you an idea of when you can see it in the night sky. But Nick, can we, how are we going to get to the night sky? Yeah. So in the real world, we have to wait for every second to go by to move ourselves towards nighttime. But in a planetarium or in Stellarium, we can speed up the clock. But um, the, the bit of science behind this is that when you speed up the clock, really you're speeding up the rotation of the Earth. So I know it's going to look like the sun and the moon are kind of zooming across the sky here for all of us. But really what's happening is we're moving. Our Earth rotates once every 24 hours. So as we move throughout the day, and you notice my clock down here kind of looks like it's going haywire. <clears throat> it is a 24-hour clock, by the way, so we're at about... 3 p.m. right now, um, uh, it looks like the sun and the moon are moving. So, you know, the moon does orbit around the earth, but this motion that you're seeing right now is because the earth is rotating, okay? So as it gets later and later, you'll see the sun dip below the horizon, which means we lose the moon as well. And then we have a nice view of a dark sky. Oh, I see a couple of bright things in particular that jumped out. Um, some planets over there in the south southeast but we'll, we'll get to those in a moment yeah and but we wanted to move your view a little bit um, for your reference this is about 9 p.m tonight and there are many interesting things in the south that we will get to but we want to talk a little bit about that moon i know we just lost it but the neat thing about time travel is we can show you what it's going to look like over the next few days but the best way for us to do that is actually to move to a western view so the cool thing about Stellarium is you can just click and drag and move your screen around. Um, and that's uh, exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to spin us around. I know that can be disorienting. Um, spin us around to face the west. So now you can probably see north is over here on our right. South, the way we were just facing, is over here on our left. And we are facing right towards the west. Um, so <clears throat> that's important for a number of reasons. We will point out a couple of things in this area of the sky. But I think, Amy, what we wanted to do was um, to find that moon again. You know, tonight we're not going to see it. But what will we need to do to find it again? So what we're going to do is we're going to stay anchored to roughly 9 p.m., so roughly an hour after sunset for central North Carolina. And we're going to jump forward one night at a time. And so you all might make some predictions for yourselves right now about if we go forward a few nights, what's going to what's gonna change in the sky? We're going to stay at 9 p.m. And right now it's Tuesday the 18th. So what happens if we go to Wednesday the 19th? Anything noticeably change? Yeah, so keep your eye on this date right here because I'm going to move us one day at a time, same view. So let's see. We're on the 18th. This is the 19th. Maybe, maybe things shifted just a little yeah, bit. Stars kind of shifted. The stars rise and set on average four minutes earlier every night. What happens if we go to the 20th? Yeah, I still don't see the moon. <gasps> Ooh, a sneak peek. Oh, oh, look at that. Okay. So if you go out uh, around 9 p.m. two days from now, August 20th, 
you might get to see the moon really low in the west right after dark. What do y'all think will happen if we go one more day? Let's mm. find out. Oh, it's a little bit higher, a little bit more convenient, actually. Okay, what if we go another day to the 22nd of August? Still again. Notice that the moon is moving relative to the, the background of the stars. Let's go. Can we go a few more days? Yeah. So we're moving all the way to about the 25th. Um, and even in the Stellarium view, you can notice that the phase of the moon is changing. Um, even though it's, you know, position at 9 p.m. is changing, the amount of sunlight that we're seeing reflected off the moon's surface seems to be changing too. Um, but I think we can probably show you that even more up close. What do you think? That it's going to involve a little bit of weird time travel. Yeah. So can we jump? back a, a week, back to August 18th. Yeah, let's try it. So remember, we just moved a week into the future, one day at a time. I'm going to take us back. Um, maybe we can start with the 21st since we can see it. And let's, let's zoom in on the moon while we do this, okay? So this time, <clears throat> we're going to be locked on the moon instead of locked in this Western view. Um, and you're going to get to see how the moon phase changes as we move one day at a time. So if you want to kind of keep track, the date down here, this is a few days in the future from now so that we could get the moon up over the horizon. Um, but watch what happens as we move forward. So this is the 21st. Okay, so that's a waxing crescent moon. It's a thicker waxing, waxing crescent moon. On the 22nd, here's the 23rd, a little bit more. M make your predictions. I'm sure you, you kind of can assume what's gonna happen here, um, but it's, it's good to make a guess. So we're on the 24th and the 25th looks like we've pretty much reached that first quarter. Yeah, so if you've learned your fractions, uh, the fact that we call this a first quarter moon might be a little confusing because it, as you can see, it's half of the side of the moon facing us that's lit up, but we don't really call it half moon. Astronomers call it first quarter uh, because it's one quarter or one fourth of the way through its orbit around Earth. So the orbit of the moon is what makes it look like it's moving if you look day after day, night after night, and it's also what makes the phase change, the amount of it that looks like it's lit up by the sun. So that might be kind of surprising how much it changed from night to night. Um, it is really noticeable. Um, of course, you need a binoculars or a telescope to get a really up-close view like this, but with just your eyes in your backyard, um, in that uh, western view in this case, you, you should be able to see the difference from night to night. Um, if you, you know, go out at a similar time. So we wanted to try to show you that because usually you don't get to time travel and see it. You have to be really patient. Um, but in, in a program like this, we can, we can illustrate it pretty well. I'm moving backwards now. Yes, you know, don't, don't try this at home. Yeah, we, <laughs> time traveling backwards is like the number one, uh, don't do it in a planetarium rule. <laughs> um, but there's a purpose here. So anyway, I went back to about the 21st and you notice that you see less of the moon illuminated. Um, but for now, let's uh, kind of shift ourselves um, back to tonight. So August 18th, and it looks like taking us back to about uh, just after 9 p.m. Yeah. And um, I'm seeing some um, Bright stars, Stellarium marks brighter stars, brighter appearing stars with bigger dots, and, and we'll give it labels if it's really bright. And um, let's see, Nick, what should we point out first? I see the Big Dipper. I wonder if anyone yeah. else sees the Big Dipper. I think we should point out the Big Dipper. It's one that lots of folks are, are able to find themselves, uh, young and old alike. Um, it's a shape that many of us can find in the sky. To our eyes, it looks like a big soup spoon that you dip into a pot of soup. Um, but really that means we're connecting the dots to seven bright stars. And there are four stars in the bowl of the Big Dipper where you put the soup, and there are three stars in the handle. So take a moment, <clears throat> look around. Um, I will give you a hint here before we, we point it out. That bright star Arcturus, if you look to the north of Arcturus, you're going to be in, in the neighborhood of the Big Dipper tonight. So yeah, maybe. Dipper, yeah, it looks to me like it's halfway or more up the sky in the northwest. Yeah, so we'll see. Um, I will try to connect the dots here. Well, it looks like we have some rogue, <laughs> rogue constellations coming up. But um, you notice I've connected the dots to, to many things, but these four stars form the bowl of the Dipper. These three stars form the handle. 
So the Big Dipper itself is not a constellation. It's part of a larger constellation. So the Dipper is what we call an asterism, just a familiar grouping of stars. Uh, but the constellation is part of, um, oh my goodness, I always do this, huh? I just bring them all up at the same oh, time. Oh, I, I like seeing all those labels. <laughs> yeah, for some reason, <clears throat> it likes to do that today. Um, this is the constellation Ursa Major, or the Big Bear. And if you like to use your imagination, Maybe you can imagine a bear there, but I don't know about you, Amy. I've never seen a bear with a big long tail. No, <laughs> but if you kind of shoot off that long tail, uh, follow the curve of that tail, follow the arc of that tail, you will arc to Arcturus, which is a very bright star. It has a, a little bit of an orangish look to it in the real sky. And it's part of the constellation. But Otis the herdsman looks like he's herding the bear. And then uh, if you keep going, if you arc to Arcturus, you can also speed on to spike us. So you follow that same general curve and um, closer to the horizon, you'll see a bright star called Spica, which is part of Virgo the Maiden. Um, and these are uh, all considered springtime constellations, by the way, and here we are well into summer, but we can still see them um, because we're out early in the evening. And so you see constellations associated with the season before when you're, you're out early in the evening, and especially they're in the West. So they will set as the night goes on, but we've got them right now. Um, but we've got um, some other things that are higher up, but Nick, I'm wondering if we can switch the view again back to the South. Yeah, we can. And, and there's a reason for this. Watch how difficult it is to see things like Ursa Major and uh, Boates and Virgo as we swing around. So I'm just going to click and drag, move us back facing towards the south. I have to kind of adjust it a little bit here. Okay, cool. So now hopefully y'all can see south right in front of us, west is on our right, east is on our left now. And, and yeah, so hopefully this shows you why we wanted to be in a different view to show you the Big Dipper because all I see is the very tip of the dipper's tail up here. Um, and, and that means in your real sky, it's just going to be high up above you. Um, but in this view, it's a little bit distorted. So we pointed out very briefly that there are a couple of bright planets. We will look at those in just a minute. But I think we wanted to point out a couple of constellations in this area of the sky too, so that you have some benchmarks. Finding these constellations is useful because it's fun to tell stories about them, but also they provide you with guideposts in the sky. Um, if you can find the Big Dipper and Arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica, you're setting yourself up to, to kind of know what's going on up there in the sky. Yeah, so, and, and I, see, I see some stuff really, really high in the sky. It looks like Vega is maybe even close to the zenith, the top of the sky. Um, and it's part of a constellation called Lyra the Lyre. And um, Vega is also part of a, a pattern, an asterism, an informal star pattern known as the Summer Triangle. Um, and some of you may know this pattern already. And if you don't, see if you can find a triangle that Vega is part of. It's three pretty bright stars that look to me like a triangle. If I'm hungry, they look to me like a pizza slice. <laughs> and um, one of them is Deneb, the tail of Cygnus the Swan. And another one is Altair, which is part of Aquila the Eagle. And so if you imagine connecting those three bright stars, Vega, Deneb, and uh, Altair, you get a pretty big triangle in the sky. So that's a good thing to look for. Um, those stars are pretty bright, so you can see the summer triangle pretty soon after it gets dark. Um, we're showing you roughly an hour after sunset, but you don't necessarily have to wait that long. And even if you live in a really light polluted place, like a big city with some bad lighting um, that's messing up your view of the sky, these stars are pretty bright, so you'll, you'll still likely be able to see them. Um, but Nick, you were mentioning there's a lot of really interesting stuff in the south we should point out. I see another really bright star kind of in the south-southwest. And that, um, it might be hard to tell here in Stellarium. In the real sky, you might notice it has a little bit of a reddish tint to it. It's Antares. And Stellarium pops up information in the top left corner um, when you click on things. So you'll see the name of that star, Antares. And uh, it translates to rival of Mars because it kind of looks like Mars. Um, and we will we will see Mars later. So uh, Scorpius the Scorpion is a pretty distinctive constellation. Um, and this about, is about as well as it gets in our sky. Um, it never gets very high above the southern sky for us um, at North Carolina's latitude because it's really a southern hemisphere constellation. But we can see it. It just pops up in the south. 
Um, and then to its left, I see what looks to me like a teapot, but it's part of a larger constellation. I see you're pointing out the handle and the lid, triangular, triangular lid, and then a triangular spout. And um, it even looks like it has steam coming out of it, the Milky Way. And it's part of Sagittarius the Archer, which is aiming at poor Scorpius there. And uh, within that same area of the sky, Nick, I see two planets. I'm guessing they're nowhere near any of those stars because planets are in our own solar system and all the stars you see at night are way outside of our solar system. Yeah, um, but they sure are bright, aren't they? <clears throat> it yeah. turns out that the planets reflect a lot of sunlight um, and that's how we see them. Uh, the sun is really the boss of our solar system. It, it puts out so much energy that if, if these things are made of anything, you know, moderately reflective, it bounces a lot of light back to us. And that's how we see planets. So the neat thing is uh, I kind of turned off some of our other constellations because I want to be able to zoom in on these planets and give you an up close view. Um, but they are going to be fairly bright compared to everything else around them tonight. Um, so that's one, that's one way that you can try to uh, kind of point them out. Is, th is there another way to kind of tell the difference between a planet and a star, Amy? Oh yeah, so planets do tend to be pretty bright. Jupiter's going to be the brightest thing in the sky um, that you're going to see in the evening sky right now, unless the moon happens to be up. Um, also, planets uh, appear only in a certain area of the sky within the zodiac constellation. So Sagittarius is a zodiac constellation, so not a surprise to see planets in that part of the sky. Also, planets tend to shine steadily rather than twinkle. And um, we have a way we keep track of that. Twinkle, twinkle, little... Star. Star, right? Not twinkle, twinkle, little planet. So if it's twinkling, it's prob probably a star. If it's shining steadily, it's probably a planet. Can we zoom in on Jupiter? Yeah, absolutely. In, in the real world, you would need a telescope to do this. Um, I don't want Sagittarius to get in the way there. <laughs> so hold on to your seats. I'm going to zoom us into Jupiter and let's... Let's see what is interesting about it. Oh, okay. look at that. Looks like. interesting about it. Uh -oh. I see four dots, Jupiter's moons, and it looks like two of them are pretty close together um, tonight. Yeah, so I was trying to get us a good, good window here so that you can see them. Um, if you're looking at Jupiter through a telescope, you can see these moons. Um, they often look like kind of bright mosquitoes or, or stars in the background. But really, if you were to track them over the course of a night, you could see that they're orbiting around Jupiter. Jupiter is massive. It has a really, really strong pull of gravity. So it pulls lots of things into orbit around it, including <clears throat> these four big moons. Um, it has dozens of other moons as well. Um, but these are, these are the four big ones, Ganymede, Io, Europa, and Callisto. Awesome. I know we're running short on time, but we want to make sure you, we get to show you some other things too. Yeah. Beautiful view of Jupiter. So it, you can see some color and some cloud bands through a, through a decent telescope. Um, it would look probably a little more like this. Yeah. Yeah. Adjust your expectations. Yeah. Um, but you might see what look like two dark bands across it. And the, you'll see the, what look like little dots. They look like almost like stars, the, the moons. They really stand out. So if you have a telescope at home, definitely take a look. And you should never miss Saturn if you have an opportunity to look at Saturn. And of course, I'm guessing a lot of you know what Saturn is famous for. Best ring system in our solar system. And, and yes, you can see the rings in a amateur telescope. If you happen to have a telescope at home and you haven't looked at Saturn yet, definitely take a look. Yeah, it's a really amazing sight. Um, it almost looks like it has ears on either side of it when you look through the telescope. But um, turns out that all the gas giant planets have rings. Saturn's are just the biggest and the brightest because of what they're made of. We think they're made mostly out of water ice. So just like in your freezer right now, there are, you know, um, huge order, <laughs> huge numbers of basically tiny snowballs and ice balls that are uh, uh, orbiting around Saturn and they're really reflective. Um, so as we said earlier, we see the planets because they reflect sunlight. Well, the rings reflect sunlight too. Um, so turns out that Jupiter has rings, Uranus has rings, Neptune has rings. They're just a little bit harder to see because we think that they have more of the rocky content and less icy content, um, which makes them less reflective. So that's something we'd love to discover more about. Maybe there are, um, you know, interesting things about the rings of the other gas giant planets, but Saturn definitely has the most prominent ones. 
Okay, so Jupiter and Saturn definitely look for those planets uh, in the evening sky. Um, and then for those of you that can stay up a little bit later, um, there are more planets. And um, Nick, I wonder if we can do a little time travel and get Mars. So everybody yeah. look for Mars to rise. So things uh, are generally gonna rise more or less in the east because of Earth's rotation. Oh, there it comes, there's the red planet. And um, it's rising right now. Um, your mileage may vary if you live somewhere else other than Chapel Hill, but roughly 1043 PM, give or take. And again, it's in a zodiac constellation, which is not a surprise. That's where you expect to see planets. Can we zoom in? Do we have time? Yeah, we have time. Let's do it. And so, very exciting. There are spacecraft headed to Mars right now. No people on board, but robotic spacecraft. Yeah, Mars is in a really convenient location compared to the Earth for launching spacecraft from Earth. So in the past month, month or so, you've probably heard a lot of news about um, what we're doing heading back to Mars. Uh, many countries, the U.S. is sending a new rover there, uh, the Perseverance rover, and it's on its way. Um, we have to wait a number of months for that trip to be complete, um, and the mission won't be complete for a long time, but it's exciting. Um, this is one of our nearest neighbors, and we think it has lots of interesting stuff going on on its surface, so we want to explore more about it. And interesting point, they, it has two moons. Two moons. Um, even though Mars is smaller than the Earth, it has more natural satellites. It has two. Um, so maybe these spacecraft that are going there will help us learn even more about these moons and where they came from. So, and Mars is rising um, earlier and earlier um, as the nights go on. So if you're not a you know stay up past 11 p.m. kind of person, <laughs> you still have a shot at seeing Mars. Um, you just got to wait for Mars and Earth to move in their in our orbits. So um, for the people out there who like to stay up insanely late, we've got another planet for you. The so-called morning star, uh, although it's not a star, it's a planet. And you're going to have to stay up past about 3 a.m. if you want to see Venus. So boy, will it grab your attention. Venus is even brighter than Jupiter. <laughs> And there it just rose, more or less in the east. So uh, rising at about 3 a.m. right now uh, for central North Carolina. Again, a little bit different depending on where you live. And um, another way to see Venus is to just, instead of staying up really, really late, you can just get up really, really early uh, before it starts getting light from the approaching sunrise. And um, Venus, you can actually see Venus in twilight pretty well. It's uh, very bright. Okay, and I know we're just got a couple of minutes left and there's a couple of questions that have come in. If y'all have questions, remember to put them into the Q&A. Um, Nick, what do you think? Can we show everybody all the constellation pictures? Sure, yeah, so that's a, a question for you after that. Um, that's a really neat thing about uh, Stellarium is that you're able to, you know, kind of fill up the whole sky. I t I'm trying to take us back just a moment because can't see all the stars right now, but let's see um, if we can get everything up at the same time. Oh yeah, okay, there's our lines, there's our names, and there's the pictures. So there are 88 of these. I know that if, um, say you watched our July Carolina Skies, we talked about some of the same ones, but never fear. As we move through the, through the year, um, we'll get to talk about different things. So especially some of these constellations like Pegasus and Andromeda and Perseus. Um, those are our fall time constellations. So as we move through the rest of this hot, hot summer, um, we'll, we'll be able to talk about those a little more, but you probably notice this is a really, really late slash early view, 5.34 AM. So um, these, these are what you see if you're an early bird before the sun rises. Okay, and there's one planet we haven't talked about. Let's, we're gonna, we have a question for you all while you're thinking of questions for us. We haven't shown you Mercury. And we're wondering if you have an idea why that might be. Why is this a bad time to see Mercury? Choose the best reason. Is it because it's being eclipsed by Jupiter? It's in the same line of sight with the sun? Or because it's just too small to see? So choose your best idea. Why is it a bad time to see? Why didn't we show you Mercury? And I'm giving you a hint here. I brought up another program, which is uh, NASA's eyes on the solar system. Helps us see a little bit of geometry in the solar system better. Take note of where Earth is. There's our planet. Take note of where Mercury is. See if that influences your answer. 
Okay, yeah, so look for Earth, look for Mercury, and then let's see what you all said. It's in the same line of sight with the sun. Uh, most of you all said that. That is, in fact, the reason. Um, the sun is, uh, when a, whenever a planet is in the same line of sight with the sun, so if you look at Earth and then Mercury, the sun is in between. By the way, if Mercury were in front of the sun, that wouldn't be a great time to see it either, unless it happened to be passing directly in front of the sun. That would be called a transit of Mercury. So it's not a good time to see Mercury. It's up in the daytime. It's, uh, its light is lost in the glare of the sun. Um, and Jupiter and Saturn, though, um, are in the opposite direction of Earth. And um, it's a good time to see them. OK. And uh, I see we've got some questions. And um, Emily asks, is it ever possible to see Bennu? She's um, referring to, oh, and if y'all can answer the question about how many people are watching, that would be great. Um, so uh, Emily asked a question about if it's ever possible to see a, a particular asteroid. Uh, NASA has a mission at this asteroid right now to um, the idea is to return samples from this asteroid. It is um, not very bright for us. So you're not going to see that uh, just with your naked eye, tragically. Um, yeah. But great question. Great question. Um, good question from Zoe here. Why do ice and rocks form rings around the planets instead of just forming clouds around them? Great question. We don't fully know, but the, one of the best ideas is that for Saturn in particular, scientists think something like an icy moon, a, a satellite of the planet, got too close to Saturn's intense gravity and was broken apart. And all of the stuff that the moon was made of, mostly ice, ended up settling into the rings. It is very cold out at Saturn. Um, so, you know, if you were to have water, um, liquid water out in orbit around Saturn, it would freeze pretty much instantly. So that's how that ice can stay ice. Um, why it's not gas just kind of depends on what broke apart and ended up settling into the rings. There is gas in the rings, um, but not as much as say, you know, concentrated in, in inside the planet. So you can, um, uh, and I know the NASA Planetary Science website has some really good resources for how to see more up close pictures of the rings because there are all these cool gaps in the rings and um, you can even see some moons traveling within the rings themselves. But yeah, to, to answer your question, I think the reason why there's ice is because something made of ice broke apart and, and settled into orbit around the planet. It's a really good one. Okay, I know we're pretty much out of time. Uh, we got a couple couple good more questions. Um, Glenn asked, do these constellations have a story to tell? Oh my gosh, there's so many great stories associated with the constellations. Um, if you look at some of our previous, uh, shameless plug, if you go to our YouTube playlist for the Morehead at Home Sky Watching sessions, um, we have told some of the stories associated with constellations. I think we even had one called Star Stories. Um, you might take a look at. Also, you can uh, check with a teacher or a librarian to help you find anybody who's interested in um, finding out more about stories associated with the constellations. A librarian can definitely help you find uh, stories from um, all different cultures around the world. Okay. And Nick, I don't know, we're, we're out of time, but if there's any, any other one you want to answer? No, there are so many good ones. What I would say is that if y'all didn't get your questions answered, we will be back on Tuesday of next week. And you can ask us then um, because we would probably stay here for another hour just talking to you about all your questions. Um, but Amy actually gave me a great segue. If you want to keep up with us beyond these sessions, please go to our website, moreheadplanetarium.org. That gives you information about what we're doing, um, you know, in, in this time at home. Um, what's going to be happening on campus in the future. Um, it's all very, very exciting. And we have a lot of resources there for you. So um, feel free to check that out. We're also on all the social medias, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, our YouTube channel, like Amy mentioned, is a really good resource because I think we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 of these Moorhead at Home sessions in the books uh, over this summer, and they're all recorded for you. So um, you'll have to kind of adjust uh, your your mind on the dates because they did happen in the past, but still valuable educational tools, we think. So um, anyway, we hope that you follow up. Uh, we hope you look at your sky tonight and we hope that you join us again on Tuesday of next week. So have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Bye.